Okay, let's go. Alright. So uh so we covered this. We're good implicit explicit attitudes, yeah? Alright. Okay, persuasion. So think of like advertisements when you see a commercial. Um, the things that are effective is if the speaker is credible, um, is an expert of some sort, that's why they have like supposedly doctors, you know, talking when they're talking about medicines of different sorts. Um, attractiveness, likability, trustworthiness, I think this is pretty common sense, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Okay, different persuasion techniques. So, when you use an attractive spokesperson, is that central or peripheral? Peripheral. peripheral. What is central? Facts. Okay, you're giving the information, you're being very direct about it. Okay? Um, foot in the door versus door in the face. When would you slam a door in someone's face? <laughs> if it's, well, okay. <laughs> if, they're, if they give you an outrageous price. So let's say they're trying to sell you something, and they come around and they're trying to sell a laptop. And they're like, this is $20,000. Next. <laughs> okay? So that's door in the face. Um, foot in the door, um, they, they want to get the foot in the door so that you don't close it, so they're going to give you a lower amount, and then they're going to be like, for $3 more, and for $5 more, and then they'll keep building you up. That's foot in the door. Yeah. And low ball effect is similar. Um, you're luring them in, but only for like the basic model, so what they're selling at a low price is, you know, like the car without wheels, or not, not the car without wheels, but just kind of like something that's not really what you had in mind, okay? Um, bait and switch, so they advertise something, and then you go there, like let's say they're advertising a car in the newspaper, you go there and they're like, oh, we don't have this one, but we have this one, okay? Because they bait, like they reel you in with bait, and then they switch it up on you. Um, framing effect is how you phrase, think frame and phrase. Um, can have an effect on whether you're likely to buy. So instead of saying, oh, would you like to buy it? You could say something like, oh, well, would you like one for you and for your for your husband too? Or like, um, would you like them in two different colors? Or something like that. How many would you like, okay? Instead of do you want to buy it? And again, mere exposure, just like the song from um, Easy A, the more you hear it or the more you see it, the more likely you are to like it, okay? Who is the source? Think of a commercial. Who's the source? The person The person the person talking to you. Okay? Um, who is the what is the message? What they're selling. What exactly they're saying. Okay? And then um, the channel is like how they're like is it through TV, in person, on the radio? Uh, and then the receiver is who? The person. You guys, right? The audience. Okay, now you guys really know classical oh, conditioning, yeah. right? Um, so this was sort of a brief intro as it pertains to advertising. Now you guys know it really well. So Pepsi and Sofia Vergara, what's the unconditioned stimulus? The Sophia. Sophia Vergara, you don't have to learn to be excited when you see her, right? What's the conditioned stimulus? So Pepsi. And what's both the unconditioned and the conditioned response? Have I Happy. Happiness. Okay, so the goal of this is if you only see the condition stimulus, which is what again? The Pepsi. The Pepsi, what are you going to do? Get happy. Get happy and buy it. <laughs> okay? Okay. And you guys really know awkward now, and you really know observational now. Okay, we're not going to go over this because you guys are pros, hopefully. Um, Okay, with the central route and the peripheral route, um, with the central route, you really think about everything that's being shown to you, all the facts and all the information. So it, your likelihood to buy the product, like it's kind of going to last longer, like you're because you're you're thinking about it more. Whereas the peripheral, you're just kind of in a daze watching, like you know, good-looking people or whatever. <laughs> so like five years down the line, you might forget about it. If you're shown the central route, it's really going to stick with you because you're thinking. The more you really think about something, the more it's going to stick with you. Okay? So central route to persuasion has high elaboration. And then peripheral route has low elaboration. Okay? But right. if you use both, you'll be good, right? Yeah, and a lot of times people do. Um, conformity. 
So give me an example of conformity. Remember, you're giving in to real or imagined social pressure. Edwin. Um, you're with your friends and they want to go steal something from the store. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to, but you don't want to, but then you're like kind of like pressured because there's a lot of all of, a lot of your friends doing it. Correct. Okay. What about this? Let's say everyone in your neighborhood mows their lawn perfectly, and you mow your lawn too because you like how it looks. Is that conformity? Yeah. No. Because you did it because you like how it looks. If if you did it because you like don't want to be the odd man out, that's conformity. Okay. Remember Ash's line study? Oh yeah. Okay. So we're gonna get to that in a second. Um, obedience is what? Orders. Following orders from usually an authority figure. Okay, good. So, Ash's line study. Okay, so remember there were a group of people in the chairs and then they were all Confederates except for this one subject in there. And they were all asked to compare lines and they were shown an original line and then three lines and asked, okay, which one matches up perfectly? Um, and so, the other six basically lied and said, no, you know, it's line number one, even though we can tell it's line number two, right, in this example. So when they got to the person who was in, who was the subject, what did he say? Mm -hmm. Number one. Number one. And it wasn't every time, and, and it, you know, it wasn't, I don't even know if it was necessarily the majority of the time, but it happened enough to, so that this, so Ash would draw the conclusion that, hey, conformity is taking place, okay? Because it's so obvious that wasn't the yeah. case, and yeah. 37, okay, yeah, 30, thank you, 37% of the time. Um, okay, cool. Factors that influence conformity. The bigger the group, the more likely you are to conform, right? Because that's more group pressure if it's a big group. Um, if uh, one person does not conform, what's likely to happen? The subject won't conform, you won't conform. So, so the biggest thing that's gonna um, prevent conformity is dissension. Or, or the presence of a dissenter. Remember that? Okay, same thing with obedience. The presence of a dissenter, and forget it, all bets are off, it's, you're probably not gonna listen anymore. Uh, remember the elevator video? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when they were facing you're absent. Absent. <laughs> If you don't remember, you've had to have been absent because it's memorable. So people were in an elevator, and there was a subject, and then there were confederates. And the confederates, instead of facing the door of the elevator, which we normally do, they face the back. And so you see, like, you know, every time they show it, the subject, be, you know, looking around, thinking they're weird, and then turning around. <laughs> okay? Um, you can find it on YouTube. You can find, like, simulations of it. So, so um, that showed conformity, but then the second they had one of the confederates facing the right way, the, the subject faced the right way. Yeah. Okay? Oh, you missed out on a good video. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, what did you hear? Okay. Yeah, you were here. Well, I, I feel like she would have remembered. Is it still filming? Yeah. <laughs> All right, obedience. So again, compliance, uh, just because someone's in authority. So remember the Milgram study with the shocking? Okay, you guys remember that? So they, the subject was told, hey, you know, we're conducting an experiment on learning and we want to see if like shocking them helps them learn better. Um, but in reality, what they were seeing is how, how far they would go shocking them when following orders. So a couple of things they messed with was, you know, they changed the, the guy, like the guy in the lab coat left and they handed it off to some other guy who just looked like a regular guy. Yeah, they were a little less likely to obey. Um, Women and men, they found, were pretty much the same. Initially, they did it in a building at Yale. When they moved locations, people were a little bit less likely to, to obey. But the main thing that made them less likely to obey was what? Dissenters. Again, the presence of a dissenter. Okay, so the second, so eventually they did studies where it was a bunch of learners and teachers, right? And then the second someone was like, no, I'm not doing this anymore, the subject was like, no, I'm not doing this anymore. Okay, but in the original study, what percentage went all the way? Um, 65, good job, very good, 65%. They would have killed the people, but they were just following orders, right? Just like a, just like the excuse in Nazi Germany, okay? So remember, Milgram was influenced by the Nuremberg trials, you guys remember that? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Um, Zim
Zimbardo. So this, now you've seen Zimbardo a hundred times too. So the Stanford prison study, remember they took a bunch of normal guys, they tested them, they were mentally okay. Um, they put them in jobs. Half of them were guards, half of them were prisoners. What happened? They were acting like, the guards were acting like guards and the prisoners were acting like yeah, they were playing the roles. The guards were very abusive, right? The, the prisoners became very kind of depressed. A lot of, uh, several of them had to leave the experiment because they underwent a lot of psychological trauma. Um, so what does that show? Social roles, the influence of social roles. We act in a way that um, we're, we kind of expect someone in that role to act, okay? And it kind of goes with, remember the Jane Elliott brown-eyed, blue-eyed ex experiment? Yeah. Kind of goes along with that, all right? So the people who were the brown eyes, you know, the ones if, when the day that the brown eyed people were the smart ones, how did they act? Better. Like better than the other people. They even performed better on tests, right? Um, and they were like a little abusive toward the blue eyed group. And then when they switched it around, same kind of thing. Okay, um, a really great study by just a random teacher. She wasn't even a psychologist. Yeah. She. I don't know if she's still alive today, but she did it again, but with college students. Oh, she did. And they kind of acted worse than the kids. Really? Because wow. they all started crying. Wow. <laughs> That's crazy. That's <laughs> I, I'll, is it on YouTube? I think so. Miss oh, Rubina yeah. had the video. Did she? Okay, I'll ask her for it. Cool. Okay. Um, so that stat showed social roles. Here's some pictures. <laughs> Oh, um, remember in psychology, ethics are always a concern. So this was considered a little bit unethical. The obedience study, Milgram study, was considered unethical. Um, with regard to ethics, after a study's done, what do you have to do? Debrief, Debrief the subjects. So you can't let them go not knowing what the study was about. Okay? What do you do? Like, You'd be in trouble. I'm sure you could lose like your license or something. Oh. Yeah. If it's really bad, like you could... Does it discredit the study? Um, it might. Like, it might not appear in a psych journal anymore, but that doesn't mean people aren't going to follow it. Follow it. Yeah, especially nowadays, like, where you can follow anything. So. Okay. Okay, group psychology. So, diffusion of responsibility. So, let's say you're given a group project. Does this sound familiar? Right? Although you guys are the students who probably always do all the work, just like mm -hmm. I was when I was your age. Mm -hmm. um, so what happens is, let's say you're in a group of five, every person is what fraction responsible? One, One fifth. One fifth. Okay, so the bigger the group, the less responsible you are. That's diffusion of responsibility. So this plays into the bystander effect. Um, remember I told you how we saw someone beating someone up, you know, along the side of the road, and my husband was like, oh, there's a lot of cars, they'll call it. I'm like, no, the bystander <laughs> event. <laughs> so, so exactly, the more people there are, the less, less likely they are to help, okay? Um, so totally wrong in thinking, oh, there are a lot of people, you know. So um, bystander effect, okay? So alone helps 75% of the time, and the presence of others helps 53%. Remember the guy passed out on the college campus? Yeah. Yeah. And everyone was just walking by. Yeah. <laughs> Social loafing, this all relates. So when you're in a group, you kind of think of the loafers and kicking your feet up on the desk. Uh, you get a little lazy. So when you're in a group, you're likely to put less effort, okay? So that's why when people are in a group, Output goes down, coordination goes down, effort goes down, basically productivity totally goes down. This is like, if you were actually, like, let's say you're given a group project and there are four people, and you assume that each person does, like, the amount of work they would have done alone, productivity should be up here, but because of all this stuff, it ends up dropping. Okay? But the, I mean, there... You're probably thinking, well, why do we have group work? You know, there are benefits yeah. to it. Um, you know, the whole more heads are better than one. You can get a little more creative when you have more people working on something. And you'll find in the workforce, a lot of times you'll have team projects together. I mean, your roles might be a little more clear. Um, but it's good practice to work in a team. So, And I'll be honest with you, when you have group work, it's like 12 things to grade as opposed to 36. And it makes a big difference. <laughs> so, that could be part of it too. All right.